regulations to make the oil and gas industry safer to prevent another similar disaster. Under this bill, such protections could be needlessly delayed. H.R. 373 was amended significantly in the subcommittee markup. As a result, a bad bill was made even worse. I know Mr. Langford plans to offer a substitute amendment that addresses some of the concerns that have been raised by the Congressional Budget Office, but unfortunately, the substitute leaves intact most of this flawed legislation. Agencies already must comply with numerous analytical requirements when issue, issuing a regulation. This legislation adds even more complexity and confusion to the regulatory process. One of the most troubling provisions in this legislation is expansions of UMBRA's judicial review process. Under this bill, opponents to the judgment of agency experts will have the opportunity to further delay the rulemaking process by entangling it in additional litigation. Finally, under this bill, private industry would have the chance to influence the composition of a rule before the public gets a chance to weigh in. The bill explicitly requires agencies to consult with private industry before the agency even makes a proposed rule, rule public, pu publicly available. Agencies should consult with industry just as they should consult with all stakeholders. However, private companies should not be given an unfair advantage over the people a rule is designed to protect. The committee has held more than 20 hearings this year targeting regulations. The, this legislation takes the committee anti-regulatory crusade, another giant step in the wrong direction. As I close, I ask unanimous consent to include in the record a letter written by the Coalition for Sensible Safeguards, an alliance of sci scientific, research, faith, labor, and environmental groups, which opposes this legislation and notes that, among other flaws, it will impose a host of unnecessary and duplicative analytical requirements on agencies before they can act to address pressing public health and, and safety concerns. Without objection, so ordered. And with that, I urge every member to oppose this bill, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Um, I will hold the record open until the end of the day so members may submit their written statements. Does anyone seek recognition? The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 373 offered by Mr. Langford of Oklahoma. The amendment has been distributed. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and original text for purpose of amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Beginning in February, my subcommittee on technology, information policy, intergovernmental relations and procurement reform began studying the effectiveness of the Unfunded Mandate Reform Act, 1995, also known as UMRA. We held three legislative hearings listening to those directly affected by government mandates. We made inquiries into the Congressional Budget Office, the Administration's Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs concerning various UMRA provisions and possible improvements. In September, we marked up H.R. 373, the Unfunded, Mandate, uh, the Unfunded Mandates Information and Transparency Act of 2011, introduced by Ms. Virginia Fox, and reported favorably out of the subcommittee. Since then, we have worked extensively with the Congressional Budget Office to address concerns raised with the reported bill. I want to thank the CBO for their valuable input. I feel confident the amendment in the nature of the substitute being introduced today addresses their concerns and still brings an awareness to the issue of unfunded mandates. To accomplish dealing with unfunded mandates, I am introducing this amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 373. ANS maintains the spirit of H.R. 373 by strengthening, by adopting further UMRA reforms recommended at the subcommittee hearings. To reiterate, the purpose of this piece of legislation is to improve the quality of the deliberations of Congress with respect to Federal proposed unfunded mandates. It has the support of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and the National Conference of State Legislatures. The American Action Forum, which is headed by former CBO Director Doug Holtz Eakin, also supports the concept in this ANS. ANS allows UMRA to identify more unfunded mandates by removing the exemption from independent regulatory agencies and allowing the chairman or ranking minority member of a committee to request a cost estimate by CBO for conditions of grant aid. ANS ensures that Federal agencies and the CBO estimate the entire cost of a Federal mandate, such as foregone profits, passed on onto consumers and behavioral changes in the results of that Federal mandate. This codifies current CBO practice and ensures agencies account for this cost. I want to reiterate again, this is not adding something new to CBO. This is their current practice. It just codifies it. 
ANS requires agencies to adhere to UMRA's requirements, even if the agency did not issue a notice of proposed rulemaking. The ANS allows UMRA to label more unfunded mandates and aligns the cost threshold with Executive Order 12866 issued by President Clinton, reaffirmed by President Bush and President Obama. The ANS requires Federal agencies to be consistent and consult with the private sector in the development of significant regulatory mandates, just like they already do for State, local, and tribal mandates. The ANS allows the chairman or ranking minority member of a committee to request that a Federal agency conduct a retrospective cost analysis of an existing Federal mandate to learn of any changes in the cost of the regulatory environment. ANS extends judicial review to help ensure agencies carefully consider the least costly, least burdensome regulatory alternative. ANS permits a point of order to be raised if a private sector mandate exceeds the UMRA threshold. Finally, the ANS formally aligns the regulatory office uh, the, the regulatory authority from the Office of Management and Budget to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which is already standard practice. I have stated before, and I will state again, making these reforms is not an attack on the current administration. Many of the issues we deal with in this ANS did not originate during this administration, and the solutions we propose will extend well beyond this administration. It is just essential that we look at the bigger picture and the long-term effects of our Federal involvement in State, local, tribal governments, and private business operation. But it is also essential that each agency is evaluated on results, not on rhetoric. It is the role and the responsibility of this Committee and Congress as a whole to ensure that regulations are consistent with legislative intent and they are written in such a way to cause the least amount of burden for the greatest amount of possible benefit. It is my goal to make certain in this modern regulatory environment Washington does not overstep its clearly defined constitutional boundaries and well-intended uh, Federal employees do not impose their preferences on State, local, and tribal governments in the private sector. I look forward to our conversation today about this and seeing the eventual passage of this important bill. With that, I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Oklahoma. Does any other member wish to speak on this bill? The, the ranking member, Mr. Cummins, is recognized. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I appreciate the fact that the majority made an attempt to address some of the concerns raised by the Congressional Budget Office, but unfortunately, this substitute does not fixed the many significant problems that still plague this bill, and I oppose the uh, flaw in legislation. With that, I yield back. And I thank the ranking member. Does anyone else wish to speak on this bill? Are you, uh, Madam Chairman, are you opening it up for amendment? I am now. Does any other member wish to uh, offer an amendment? Madam Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman is recognized. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 373 offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia. I thank the Chair. My amendment changes the existing language in the current bill referring to indirect costs and regulatory reporting requirements to net costs accounting for benefits including lives saved to State, local, and tribal governments. It is important to analyze not only the cost of unfunded mandates, but also the benefits. It is important that we recognize that regulations serve a purpose in protecting the American people from a variety of dangers that would otherwise occur if these protections were not in place. For each year from 2000 to 2010, the annual estimated benefits for the rules and regulations reviewed by OMB, the Office of Management Budget, also far outweighed the estimated costs. Estimated benefits range from $132 billion, the low estimate, to as much as $655 billion, the high, while the estimated costs were $44 billion to $62 billion, respectively. When we are talking about EPA, for example, issuing a rule to keep harmful bacteria out of our drinking water, or the Consumer Product Safety Commission issuing a rule to protect children from hazardous substances, it doesn't make sense to only analyze the costs of implementing those rules without also considering the benefits, including health, uh, health benefits and lives saved. Mr. Chairman, it is important that agencies focus not just on the cost of regulations, but also focus on the benefits. This amendment would simply ensure that agencies take benefits into account when also calculating the cost of a rule. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Before I recognize the next uh, uh, individual, I, the chair would announce that the intention is if there are any rolled votes or any votes requested, they will be rolled and they will occur 10 minutes after the last vote on the floor, which we expect to have. Uh, 
I'm sorry, after the last vote from the first set of votes. So uh, members who are here and staffs that will be informing members, they should come directly from the floor vote back here if there are any recorded votes, which, of course, we anticipate there won't be. <laughs> the Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma in opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do want to speak in opposition to this amendment in, in a couple of ways. One is it, it seems to be redundant because it is already in the bill. Uh, on page uh, 8 and 9, it, it deals with this same issue of um, how things come together, a qualitative, quantitative assessment, including underlying analysis of benefits anticipated from the proposed rulemaking or final rule, such as the promotion of the efficient functioning of the economy, private markets, enhancements of health and safety protection of the natural environment, and elimination or reduction of discrimination or bias. Uh, so that, that is already included. And the second thing is, is, is that already in the, the, uh, the term effects has already been interpreted uh, to mean both the costs and the benefits. Uh, so that is already included in this. Uh, so it, it's a little confusing to say that we have to add this thing ab about the, the benefits and also accounting for lives saved uh, when it is already included in the bill itself, number one. Uh, number two is if, if it is the intention uh, of the minority to, to say that we have to then balance this out, uh, the net effect of both the cost and the life saved, I have, I have a difficult time balancing the cost of a single life saved. Uh, so if the, if the issue is we have to balance the economic cost against a, a life saved, well, it is impossible to put the value on an individual life. And uh, so uh, for those reasons, I, I would have to oppose this. Would my colleague yield? I absolutely would. I, I would simply point out two, two things. One is, if this is simply redundant, then I can't understand the nature of my colleague's objection. Secondly, I think my colleague has to distinguish between what happens after UMRA is triggered and what happens before. Obviously, my amendment deals with the latter, not the former. And I think when my colleague says it is redundant, it really isn't, because we are dealing with two different parts of the process. I, I yield back to my colleague and thank him for yielding. Right. Would thank the gentleman you. further yield? Yes, I would. Uh, I heard the gentleman's comments, but I didn't hear a response to the part about the net. I think the gentleman from Oklahoma's uh, remarks about you can never net even one life uh, saved or lost uh, against any amount of dollars. Would the gentleman respond to that? Well, as a matter of fact, we've had, uh, I would respond. Um, we've had hearings on, on this committee, for example where we have looked at EPA assessments of the net benefits. For example, we had a hearing with the Attorney General of my home state, Virginia, uh, not so long ago, in which I entered data into the record of the net benefits uh, associated with EPA regulation, uh, and, and they did a calculation. So it's, it's not an impossible thing to do, and many of the agencies, in fact, do it. Uh, OMB, I cited in, in my statement, um, some data from OMB, they try to get their arms around at least an estimate of the net benefits when they are looking at the net cost. Re reclaiming my time on it, I, I understand that the, uh, the difficulty is this in looking at this language on it, because it is already included into this bill and I think could cause some confusion. I'm going to oppose this just because I want to make sure that we keep it clear, straightforward language throughout this and that we don't have the tendency at some point to say now we have to uh, get a certain number of attorneys to then determine what the value of a single life is and then weigh it against this. And somehow now we can't have unfunded mandates because it has the potential at some point of saving a life and that's going to, a single life is worth $7 billion and so this is not an unfunded mandate anymore. I, I don't want to have to create that environment in future days to come for interpretation. So I would rather leave it straightforward and simple as it currently reads. And with that, I oppose it and I yield back. If no other member wishes to speak, the question is on the amendment uh, by the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the Chair, the noes have it. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments? The ranking member is recognized for the purpose of offering an amendment. The, uh, the clerk read the amendment. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 373 offered by Mr. Cummings of Maryland. Yes, the the gentleman is recognized. All right. The, um, <clears throat> Chairman, the underlying bill, uh, we are considering mandates an unfair advantage 
for corporations and businesses in the rulemaking process. And my amendment eliminates that advantage. Section 10 of the underlying bill will require agencies to also provide private sector corporations, but not other stakeholders, an advanced opportunity to influence proposed regulations. <clears throat> we should not require agencies to give business interests a special uh, advantage over consumers and other stakeholders uh, who would be directly impacted by proposed regulations. <clears throat> Can you imagine the impact of applying such a rule on Med to Medicare? It would require agencies to seek input from the insurance companies before they, they considered the opinions of the elderly. Well, how about Wall Street reform? This law would uh, mandate that the Wall Street firms have the opportunity to weigh in on regulations before investors and the American taxpayers who have been forced to bail out those same uh, firms. That is simply unacceptable. Mr. Chairman, I, my amendment would eliminate the requirement of the bill to provide an unfair advantage to corporations and other business interests during the rulemaking process. We should not mandate a rule that prevents everyone who may be affected by proposed regulation from having a fair opportunity to share their views at the same time. I urge the adoption of my amendment. Gentleman yield back. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would oppose this. Okay. Uh, this does not create some sort of um, uh, new layer, I guess, in it. Uh, this already occurs with State, local, county governments. Uh, when an unfunded mandate uh, is, is determined uh, through the UMRA of 1995, we already have those conversations with State, local, and county governments. Uh, what is excluded are those private entities. Uh, now, I would like to include those because I have this tendency to believe that if you get the affected parties together and they are able to have a conversation, sometimes you can get a sense of here is where to cut off some of this. It still goes out to propose rulemaking. There is still plenty of input from any outside group. In fact, the bill itself even encourages people that disagree with industry to be included in those early parts of that conversation. So it is not just a single voice saying, for instance, if there is going to be a, a regulation coming down the airline industry, only airlines are, are consulted in this, but it is those that are affected should be at the table. And then it goes out to complete public comment. And so it just allows that unique conversation. And let me give a quick illustration with that. Uh, yesterday we had a hearing in, in my subcommittee, and it was dealing with Federal procurement policy. And they're right now, Federal procurement agencies are sending out information to all their contracting officers, what they are calling a myth buster, that procurement officers and contracting officers cannot engage with industry during the course of that conversation. There has been a wall of separation between industry and uh, the Federal Government during the contracting process. They are sending out messages saying, stop that. We are actually hurting the process by not engaging the affected parties in this conversation. So that has actually impeded our contracting in the Federal uh, leadership that we met with yesterday all said we are trying to knock down that wall because we have erected it too high, so we have to engage with this. Uh, so in this reason, I, I, I just have a belief that you can get a chance to get the affected parties together. They can make the rule better at the very beginning rather than cause all of the consternation that happens during the rulemaking process and the affected parties hope that they get a voice at the table. We do get a voice at the table for everyone and that we are not excluding someone in that. So with that, I would oppose this amendment. And would the gentleman yield? I absolutely would yield. I would like to join with you in opposition. Uh, in my own district, I have a number of uh, Native American tribes, and I hear over and over again from regulatory agencies how difficult it is to have consultation, and repeatedly I see them greenlight uh, various uh, projects only to discover that there are sacred lands there, things which every tribe already knew, but they don't give notification to the tribes, much less consultation. So. I think that the gentleman is absolutely right, that any time you can have more notification, not less notification, especially early in the process, it is in everyone's best interest. And I commend the gentleman for the underlying bill that does that. Yield. Thank you. I yield back. There is no further uh, uh, discussion. The question now occurs on the amendment offered by Mr. Cummings. All of those, uh, all those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. Nay. In the opinion of the Chair, the nays have it. The nays have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Roll call. Uh, uh, roll call on that one. Uh, a roll call has been requested and pursuant to the earlier uh, agreement uh, that will be rolled until after the first set of House floor votes. Are there any further amendments? No further amendments. The question occurs oh, I can't do that. 
at this point we will recess until We're going to, and we'll do a roll call on the final vote. But uh, at this point, uh, since this is the last piece of business before the final vote, we will uh, suspend any further uh, process until Im immediately, that being 10 minutes after the, la uh, the last vote of this first session on the floor. That, uh, what time is that estimated to be? It could be as late as 3. Uh, but we believe that is the, uh, the best way rather than trying to get everybody back from their lunch and appointments at this time. So we stand in recess.